Good morning, everyone. This is going to be a deeper dive into turning. There is a short introductory video introducing turning broadly and a lathe in particular. In this case, we're actually going to look at some more specifics of how you make a turning operations work for you and how you would use a lathe and the kinds of things you're going to need to think about and how to think about them. So firstly, we want to talk about the actual process of metal cutting broadly. So it's the process of removing unwanted material. Metal turning is a subtractive process. We're starting with a large block and just like a sculptor, we're removing all the pieces of the block, revealing the part design that we want. I would argue that we take a harder thing and we ram it into a softer thing, uh, cutting away and splitting away the parts we don't want. And in fact, if you look at this video here, which is a highly zoomed in, very magnified version of a cutting edge forcing itself through a material where the actual grain of the metal has been revealed. You can actually see the bottom piece of the metal passes almost untouched under the edge, uh, while the top edge, the material is cut away, deforms and pushes up on the edge. And that's actually what would break away and fly away from the cut as a chip. It works just like a wood chisel going through wood. Basically, you drive the chisel along the wood and a big curl of material comes off the top of it. So that's metal cutting. And when you're doing metal cutting, milling, turning or drilling, you basically care about the same principles. We're not going to talk about the formulae in this particular lecture, but you need to be aware of it. We need to know how fast the cutting edge is passing over the material. In a lathe, that is surface peep per minute as in how fast the surface is moving past um, the actual cutting edge, and also the, what's called the feed rate. Um, on a mill, they're called your feeds and speeds. Uh, on a lathe, um, we also have feeds and speeds, but uh, the feed is measured in revolutions of the bar. But these are numbers you have to derive based on the tool, the material, the operation. There's a lot that goes into here, and there are calculators and helpers, and we have a lot of experienced folks to help you but you're going to have to pick a how fast you're going to spin the material and how fast and hard you're going to move the tool and how deep a cut you're going to take. These are all kind of design choices. So feeds and speeds go with the general principles of metal cutting of jamming a hard thing through a softer thing. So the process of making a part on a lathe. Uh, the first thing you need to do is select suitable stock. And on a lathe, starting from a cylinder is definitely the easiest. There are always ways of accommodating odder designs and shapes, but honestly, trust me, pick a cylindrical size. Um, typically, you want to buy stock for a part, you, you need at a minimum about two and a half times the length of the part in the cylinder. And if you can design it, you could even design your part so the outer edge of the cylinder is the right size of your part, so you don't even have to do an OD turning operation to get it to the final size. You may need to do it for finish, though. Typically two and a half times because you're going to need some stock to hold in the collet or the chuck. And um, two and a half times because you, it's not unusual to mess it up or end up with a substandard result first time you do any new part. Then as a designer your job is to create a sequence of lathe operations that when chained together make the actual part. If we look at our little video running here. When it starts, we first do that facing operation, then we do an OD turn, an OD profile, and then bring in a drill to bore out the center hole. So very quickly, facing, OD, OD profiling again, OD profiling again, drilling. Okay, for this particular example. So it's a sequence of specific operations creating a certain effect on the part um, that finally deliver your final part. Now, obviously, this one isn't finished, but it's a good example to start. So, lathe ops break down into two important types. We have the roughing type and the finishing type. And if you look at the slide here, I'm hoping the videos illustrate the difference. Roughing is when you're going to remove a lot of material very quickly. You can see, if you remember that slow-mo from the beginning, you can see the chip ribbon, that distorted piece of metal. And as the metal bends, it heats. And if you look, you can actually see the smoke is coming from the chip and not from the part, which is an important trick in machining. That red hot chip gets broken off and flies away, carrying the heat energy with it, leaving your part and your tool actually pretty cool. 
So that's taking a very deep gouge, but the trouble is a very deep gouge is a lot of stress on the machine frame, on the tool, on the bar, on the insert. It's less accurate and you get a rougher finish on the actual part you left. Then typically after you've done your roughing to get the major material out of the way, you will come in for what's called a finishing pass, which you can see in operation here, where you take a very fine thread of material off. There's a very low amount of stress. It's a slower process. You're removing less material per pass but it's much more accurate and it gets you a good finish. So big roughing cuts to get it mostly right and then finishing cuts to um, create that final look. Specific operations on a lathe. There are a number of them. We're going to look at them quickly. So facing is what you see here and the video I think shows it all. It puts a flat face on the end of the bar. You can actually use it to shorten the bar's length. You can actually take off a lot with the roughing pass and then do a finishing pass on it. You can also actually, if you've bored a hole into the part, you can face a flat inside that hole. So it can actually be an internal face. But in all cases, you can see it's directly related to the axis of rotation and it's creating a nice smooth uh, flat end or flat inside your part. So that's a facing operation. Then we have the inside, turning inside or uh, inner diameter or turning outside outer diameter, sometimes also called boring. So we mentioned the facing creates flat face and shortens the part. The OD pass removes the material from the outside and the ID removes material from the inside. Profiling is what that top video is doing. You can see the tool moving in to create this geometric profile which actually finishes the part that you want. And that is called profiling and that is often done with ID and OD tools. So this was an OD profiling. Um, at the bottom, it just is kind of straight boring. Um, if you'll forgive the pun, it's a, it's a boring operation or an ID turning way. They're enlarging the center hole by putting in another cutting tool as it spins. The tool choice, i.e. the choice of the shape of that triangular cutting edge, limits what you can do. Because if you think about it, you have to kind of reach round. If you wanted to make that piece that's being cut now very thin in the middle, you need a very aggressive tool to kind of come round. In fact, there's another operation for getting kind of very steep inside ones with a different size tool, which we'll talk about. Uh, drilling is just like normal drilling. However, on a lathe, when we're spinning the part, if you can imagine the end of the part spinning round, the only place the drill can come in is in exactly within the rotation. Like we saw in that first video, you come in in the middle. If you came off off center, it's going to twist and break the drill. Um, so you can only drill in the middle, but it works just like normal drilling. Grooving is that thing I mentioned when you need a very aggressive, it's too aggressive for profiling to get you the kind of thing you need. Uh, grooving with a grooving tool creates these thin channels into the part, but it needs a specific tool to do so. And you can groove on the outside of a part. You can stick a grooving bar inside a hole in a part. And in actual fact, uh, part off is like a specialized version of grooving with a very long grooving bar and a part off tool literally cuts all the way into the bar till the part falls off. Hence, it's called part off. And in fact, uh, many CNC lays will have what's called a bar feeder. So you'll load a 12 foot bar of stock that sticks out the back of the lathe and it will push it forward six inches, clamp it, cut the part, part off and then unclamp, extend another six inches of the bar, clamp again, and do a new part just continually. So grooving is for making those kind of high profile grooves where you want a nice slot cut into the outside inside. Finally, lathes are also good at making helical designs and helical designs means threads. So this is a video you can see it using a threading insert on the outside and you can do insert inside threading as well. Um, but basically, it, with every pass, it's removing more material to create this lovely deep thread on the end of the bar. Um, you can do multiple what's called pitches of thread, fine pitches, uh, coarse pitches, because uh, the lathe is pretty capable at uh, changing the speed at which it moves. The whole thing's synchronized with how the spindle rotates. It can also be done on a manual lathe. It's not just the province of computer controlled lathes. I believe computer controlled lathes make it easier, but mechanical lathes have mechanical assists to do this kind of work. You can actually, um, while you can do inside diameter threading, if it's going to be a small threaded hole, it's much better to just use a cylindrical tap like you would a normal drilled hole 
and hold it in the tailstock and just or in another block and just bring it in along the center line. So threading, um, we talked about facing, we've talked about uh, OD turning, we've talked about drilling, uh, we've talked about ID turning, we've talked about grooving, now we've talked about threading. So these operations are the ones that you chain together in the order that you need them chained together to create that final part that you want. So now we've talked about the different operations and what they can do for you, let's look a bit about the kind of tools that make them happen because these are the kinds of things you need to know. So in the photo, we have a turret and I have put uh, gold dots next to all the radial tools and green dots next to all the axial tools. The bit you can't see, and I need to get a better photo of this, is the spindle with the stock in it is pointing directly at the middle of the turret off to the left, bottom left side of this photo. So effectively, axial tools are pointing at the end of the rod and radial tools basically point at 90 degrees sticking out sideways. When you're doing OD work, for example, that will be a radial tool because it needs to get to the outside of the bar. When you're doing ID work and when you're, mm, when you're doing uh, drilling, for example, that's an axial tool that comes in on the end of the bar. Now, again, when we did uh, types of operation. We talked about roughing operations and smoothing operations. Well, when we talk about tooling, the sharpness of the point matters. A very sharp point gets you a very fine finish, can get into difficult to reach parts and crevices, can make sharper angles and clearer things. It also wears and breaks the easiest. A, bra a very round, in fact completely circular, is the strongest form of insert can remove huge amounts of material without wearing out quickly and without breaking. And that's called the nose angle of the tool. So how pointy is my tool? Large nose angles and blunt tools are great for removing huge amounts of material because they're very strong. Very pointy nose angles are perfect for that finishing pass. So on a normal turret, I would normally have a, a large nose angle boring bar and ID bar and a small nose angle ID bar, so that gives me rough material rem removal inside a part and finished material removal inside a part. Then for the outside, I would have an axial, uh, sorry, a radial tool for um, doing the profiling, roughing, and smooth finishing. And again, I would have a broad, a blunt nose angle for roughing and a fine nose angle for. Um, that finishing. So you've already got kind of four tools which you normally will load in a turret. Unless you're going to do no inside work in case it's just the outside. But the one thing you'll notice is you nearly always need one more turret location than you have. You always need one more tool than you have a turret location. A last point about tools which goes for, it's it holds true for drills, it holds true for end mills, it holds true for nearly anything and it's something I think you intuitively know which is if you grabbed a stick off the floor and it was long and thin and you waggle it backwards and forwards, you can whip it backwards and forwards. And if you grab a very short, short, thick log of wood and tried shaking it, it doesn't vibrate at all. We want our machines, generally speaking, to be as stiff as possible. So when the machine moves through the motions or you're driving the hand wheels on a manual, you're trying to imprint your will into the metal, wood, whatever, plastic of the part. And in doing so, you uh, want your machine not to flex, if possible, and you want it not to vibrate. So shorter bars, uh, have the bar slid all the way into the block so it just sticks out just far enough to get the job done. Shorter drills, make stiffer drills and more likely to create the hole in the right place. Basically, shorter and stiffer tools are generally always better than longer, thinner ones, if you have a choice. So that's a very quick overview of what is quite a large topic. Let's have another look at a closer look at some of this radial tooling. So on the far left, we have our uh, kind of down there on the far left, you can see the OD turning uh, turning bars. Now, outside diameter tools are normally square. And I'm sure you will ask you why in a minute, but I'm sure you'll figure it out. So they're square and you can see here a very aggressive nose angle, that sharp pointy diamond. And you can see a very blunt uh, broad nose angle one, that squat one. 
and the squat one which looks much more like a square or parallelogram is the roughing one and the very pointy one is the finishing one. You'll notice as well that most inserts are reversible so you get kind of two cutting edges for the price of one when one wears out you can loosen the screw and flip them around. Then if we move to the grooving bar you can see that the cutting edge is that tiny little notch on the end and it's got a huge amount of support because it's such a thin blade and that's the grooving bar which pokes into the material to make the groove. Um, that next one along with that spiky jaggedy one is the threading insert where the spike of the insert is actually the shape of the V shape of the screw thread that you want. And then finally I mentioned the part off bars which needed the most support and that's because they've got a basically cleave a thin notch all the way into the middle of the however thick a metal bar that you've got to actually get it to drop off. So they're rather like a grooving bar, but even more so with even more massive support behind them so they don't break away. So um, turning bars, grooving bars, threading bars and part off bars. And normally all the stuff working on the outside of the bar or on the end of the face of it is square in cross section. Right, and it's square for easy installation and strength. Nearly all the stuff that has to go inside the hole in the middle of a part to do detail out the inside is round. And the reason is quite simple. If you're trying to fit into a round hole, you can get a thicker round bar into the hole than you can a square bar. And thicker bars are stiffer and just work better. So again, we get to that uh, thicker and bigger and heavier duty the bar is, the stiffer it is, the less vibration, the harder you can cut, um, the more accurate the results will be. So, um, thin and long, trouble, thick and stubby, success. Now those radio tools normally fit in this wedge tool holder, which you can see uh, kind of it's photographed at both angles. And actually that square bar is relatively easy. It's easiest to clamp. It goes in the socket and then a wedge is put at the bottom and then finally a block is screwed in between the tool and the wedge and you crank it in and torque it down until it's grabbed everything and everything is basically hard and flat against the surfaces it's supposed to be. So the bar is supposed to be flat against the bottom of the pocket and hard up against the side of the pocket. The wedge is supposed to be against the back of the pocket against the bottom of the pocket and then you um, screw the block into the middle and bolt it in. It's a bit of a tricky process and it is completely critical that it be completely clear of metal chips and dirt before you start because any metal chip or dirt that gets wedged in there could interfere with the grip on the bar and that can cause a terrible problem if you throw a bar during the lathe operation. Think of the kind of force that the bar has to stand up to. So just be mindful when you're doing the tooling that you want uh, scrupulous cleanliness on when uh, any kind of tooling operation. Axial lathe tooling, this is the stuff which sticks out. And these guys go into, you can see an example of a boring bar mounted in a block mounted onto a turret in the CGI picture I've got. And these are the kinds of things that go inside. And you can see the ID boring bars. Um, on the end of those, you can also put a little threading insert if you need to cut a thread. I don't have a picture of an ID grooving bar. Um, and then we've got two kinds of drill. Your classic twist drill that you're probably very familiar with. An insert drill you may not have seen before, but uses these ultra hard carbide inserts just in the end of it. Uh, again, to basically mimic a carbide, a big carbide twist drill, uh, which is actually too expensive to make because solid carbide tools are very pricey. So axial lathe tooling uses blocks, radial tooling uses these wedge tool holders. So tooling blocks, they hold the axial tools. Um, they have some advantages. You can push coolant through the tool and nozzle. You might actually notice the two holes on the end of the insert drill in the center of our three examples. That's so coolant can squirt out of the holes into the hole as it's being cut, which is fantastic because that actually pushes all those metal chips back up and out the hole. It's also very hard to lubricate the end of a drill when it's buried inside a hole. I mean, if you spray coolant from the outside, almost none of it goes in. And how can it go in? There's metal chips flying out the hole. I mean, it's a real problem. 
Often when you're trying to install something into a block, that hole in the block is of a standard size, so you have to use a sleeve to adapt the bar to meet the size of the block. And um, the thing is, generally speaking, aligned. The whole lathe is meant to be aligned before you start, so it's already aligned on the center line of the part, and it should all line up nicely. Lastly, um, we actually have some really advanced technology at the Bechtel Innovation Design Center. You will find it out in the world as well. Something called live tooling. In a previous lecture, I know I've mentioned this before, but there's machining isn't simple. So a live tooling enables you to turn your lathe into a very good lathe and a pretty good mill. And the rotary table, likewise, would allow you to take a very good mill and make it a fairly good lathe. So this is a lathe uh, pretending to be a mill, where basically instead of those blocks that you saw, or the wedge holders where the tool doesn't move, this is a powered head where the tool can spin independently. And you can see on the left video a kind of combination where it's using a fixed tool to cut the profile, and then it's using a series of spinning tools uh, from the live tooling, an axial spinning tool and a radial spinning tool to make those other features, to cut away part of it and to then start putting the teeth on the outside. Uh, on the far right, we've got a um, radial end mill, which is cutting the slots of a chess piece. It's the head of a castle in chess, if you haven't spotted it. So we have an ST20Y, which has live tooling, and basically it now means that you stop the lathe uh, spinning, uh, the main act spinning, but you can drive it backwards and forwards in specific steps. So it now becomes like the rotary table in a mill, and the tool inside the actual turret starts spinning and then cuts away material. So it's a very powerful way of not having to take your material out of the lathe and carry it across to the mill. Because every time you take a block of material out of one machine and put it into another machine, you're going to lose accuracy. And also a lot of time. It takes a lot of human time to do this. So live tooling is a kind of compromise where you want a mostly turned part with some milled features. And likewise, a rotary table in a mill kind of does the same thing. You want mostly milled features, but with a few rotary bits, if that makes sense. So live tooling, very cool. So how do you program this? Well, at the Bechtel Center, we would traditionally, in past years, you would do pretty much all your simple lathe operations using a system called VPS, when you would be standing at the CNC control, and it's effectively like a... Oh, if you're familiar with them, wizards in software, it would be like you would say, I would you would pick from a menu, I want a facing operation. It would say, How long's your stock? How wide your stock? What speeds and feeds do you want to run at? What's the dimensions of your tool? And various other information. And it would generate the programming inside the lathe to run that cycle. It's actually quite slow, it's quite error prone. I mean, the system doesn't give you much feedback when if you've, if you've got an inch bar and you accidentally hit one twice and you set it to 11 inches, there's no real information there that's going to, except you carefully reviewing the numbers, that's going to prevent a nasty mistake. The future and the present is in CAM, just like for a mill. If you're going to use a CNC lathe, then you're going to want to do it in CAM because you would get it, it would be visual, it would be simulatable, you would see the different tools, you get a picture of the different tools, you would see what paths they're going to take, you see the stock removal, you see the sequence of operations. So CAM is um, definitely the best. It's also much less likely to cause a collision. Lays are a collision nightmare. And the reason is quite simple. If I just jump back a few slides, you can see that the turret has things that stick out, things that stick out sideways, it is terribly easy to not retract the turret far enough when you do the rotation and that bar will just smash into your part, destroying your part, or it will hit the chuck and bend itself. Worst case, the lathe can get out of alignment, so the turret and the lathe spindle are no longer aligned. It's a pain. In CAM, it's a lot safer because the computer will manage a lot of that for you. Firstly, uh, lastly, a quick word on work holding in the lathe. If you remember, the two problems of machining is holding onto your stock and holding your tool. Well, we've talked about blocks and wedge holders. Now we need to talk about work holding in the lathe. 
There are two main styles. You'll find yourself with a three-jaw chuck, which can hold uh, round stock, hexagonal stock, triangular stock. You can grab it nicely with the three-jaw chuck. The collet system in, on the left is hugely superior. Instead of just grabbing it on three bits around the outside, a collet system will grab the whole thing, but it can only grab cylinders and only cylinders of known sizes. So that's perfect for when you've picked your stock yourself and you say, okay, I've got one inch bar. We will put in the one inch collet and it will grab and hold very centrally and very well. Three jaw chuck mm, can be much more of a pain to set up. You've got to make sure the jaws are aligned. It may not grab it quite as, it doesn't grab it as accurately as a collet. So I remember my recommendation at the beginning, cylindrical stock. Honestly, cylindrical stock and collet is the way to go. Um, but three jaw chucks are powerful in the fact they're very flexible and can hold arbitrary size stock. You notice that in this particular diet, uh, picture, some of the jaws are colored in red. That's because it's not at all unusual to install mm, sacrificial jaws in the chuck. And actually your first operation is to machine away the pieces of the chuck jaw that you don't want, i.e. those areas highlighted in red. So now you've made three specific jaws exactly for your problem. And by cutting them away, they're now exactly rotationally aligned with the axis of the actual spinning of the spindle. So with what they're called soft jaws, cut, you can be as accurate as a collet and get a very fine kind of grip. You can also cut all sorts of weird patterns using the mill. If you want to hold a non-round thing, soft jaws are one of the better options to do that because then you can cut weird profiles into each jaw and then grab your strange shape where you need to. But those are very advanced ideas. Again, work holding could be the subject of a much longer lecture. But if you've picked your stock size carefully and you've bought a uh, known good circular stock, call it. If not, then free jaw chuck. There's some um, example videos. The ST20Y uh, going through a full production of something is the first one. Uh, I've also picked two kind of what are kind of multi-spindle, incredibly expensive CNC demos, which you might find fun to watch as well to see the kind of very high end of the art. I My machines are, the ST20Y is just um, shy of $100,000 to buy. These machines, mm, three quarter of a million, almost a million dollars to purchase, but they're very cool to watch and they can make amazingly complex parts impressively quickly and phenomenally accurately. Anyway, thank you for coming to our whistle stop tour through lathes uh, operations. Now remember those operations, what operations in what sequence do you need and then what tooling to make those operate, you know, the, you need to associate a tool with an op. And then finally, how are you going to hold your stock and so on? And you will have the most amazing round parts in no time. Have a good one.